in its frail condition, I could not imagine the rabbi tolerating the wooden seats, the jarring ride, and the stuffy air. That night when I shared my concern with my mother, the first feelings I remember ever sharing with her, she assured me that contrary to what Kiki had said, good Jews did go to heaven just like good Catholics. Under different circumstances, her explanation would certainly have fallen on deaf ears. But I dearly wanted this poor old man to be excused from the trolley ride. I accepted Mother's revelation eagerly. Of course, when she then tried to tell me that Jesus himself had not been Catholic at all but Jewish, I knew where to draw the line. Well, the next morning our guide came for us in a horse-drawn sleigh and was a start of two very long and very scary days in the course of which Mother and I lost our mountaineer guide, lost our way, and found things happening to us and ourselves doing things we had not thought possible, as well as a couple of plot twists you would not consider believable in a piece of fiction. But at least my Judeo-Catholic soul was at long last at peace. My book, Mother and Me, ends as a bedraggled peasant woman limps into the lobby of Bud Budapest's posh Bristol Hotel, accompanied by her eight-year-old son, who is having difficulty suppressing his giggles. She demands a room. The desk clerk tells her there are no vacancies. Nonsense, the peasant woman snaps. The Bristol always has vacancies. The desk clerk can't resist a bit of sarcasm. Mother, I'm sorry, let me, let me do that again. The desk clerk can't resist a bit of sarcasm. Madam has stayed with us before, he asks. Of course. And under what name? She tells him her name. The desk clerk looks at her more closely, does a double take, and bursts into tears. She bursts out laughing, and they hug across the counter. Now, I have not seen Miss Bronya or the aunts and cousins since we left them in Poland. I have heard, though, that they survived. What has become of them since, I do not know. As for my beloved, pious Kiki, I've been told that she did not survive. But I can see her right now. She's sitting on a park bench, knitting a pair of short pants for little Jesus and admonishing him not to play with any strange children. That's an incredible story. Yes, it is. <laughs> if I don't, I don't mind saying so myself. Now, uh, Kiki, she didn't make it, huh? Kiki did not make it. Uh, Kiki was, was not a survivor. She huh. was a sweet person, uh, but she, she, was, she was not the kind of person who could get through those things. She, she could not cut into lines the way my mother could yeah. and so forth. Yeah. Now, you didn't approve of it then, but uh, now in retrospect, in, in res retrospect, it's, it's what, what saved my life. Yeah. Now, um, <clears throat> what about uh, Miss Bronya? Did she make it through the war? Miss Bronya and my two aunts and, and, and their two kids, I've been told, made it through the war, but they did not get out of Poland. They, they spent the war in Poland. And you, have you corresponded with them? or? No, them? I haven't. Okay. No, I haven't. They, I, I, I'll tell you, they were not really blood relations of mine. They were, the, the two aunts were related to my stepfather, Lolek. Okay, okay. And uh, now I'm very uh, amazed. The, the talent of your writing is that you really were able to get into that uh, seven-year-old <laughs> place within you. You know, that seven-year-old is still th there within you someplace. Well, I've been I've been told numerous times that I've 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 never grown out of that seven year old. Yeah, that, yeah. That I'm still a seven year old. They say I, I think psychologists say that when there's a trauma, this kind of a uh, uh, dist distillation in the sense that that um, you stay in a uh, certain psychological mindset in, in a certain sense throughout your life, uh, and that certainly was uh, a lot of trauma happening there. That was a lot of trauma, yes. Now, you went in the train and you were trying to escape the Russians, but 
the Russians were not at war with you. What, what were you afraid of the Russians about? The, well, the, the Russians were occupying uh, eastern Poland. Yes. Uh, they had, you know, a, a, sec a secret pact with the Germans that uh, they, would, they would divide Poland between them. Huh. And while uh, the Polish army was fighting the Germans to the west, the, the Russians marched in from the east unopposed. I see. And, 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 and they, they took over, and, and, and uh, we were under, un, under Russian occupation. Now, it wasn't as, as harsh an occupation as, as, as under the Germans, but yeah. it was still occupation. We weren't allowed to leave. I see. So <coughs> it was really the Russians that you were afraid of, not so much the Germans. You only, heard, right. you only heard about the Germans, but you never really saw them. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Now, when you took that train, it took you to sort of the border or near the Carpathian Mountains? It was a, a, a village uh, in the, at, 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 the, at the foothills, I suppose, of the Carpathian Mountains, yes. Okay. And you wanted to, uh, you walked over those mountains. Uh, how long did it take you to make that trek? We walked for 11 hours. Okay. What, what happened was that th we, the, the guide came for us in, in, in a horse-drawn sleigh with his nephew, and the nephew was driving the, the sleigh, and we were going to go to a road that uh, ran at the base of a mountain on the ridge of which was the Hungarian border. Once we were on the other side of that border, supposedly we were safe. Well, at, at one point the sleigh was supposed to stop, and my mother and I and the guide were supposed to jump out, and the guide's nephew would drive the sleigh on to uh, wherever they were going. So the sleigh stopped. The guide said, jump. We jumped, and he didn't. Hmm. The, the uh, guide and his nephew continued on in the sleigh, and there we were at, at the foot of this mountain. There, there, there Russian guards walking back and forth with rifles. Fortunately, the, the guide had bribed the uh, two the two nearest guy huh. guards. I see. But that wasn't the deal, was it? They were supposed to take That was not the deal. <coughs> You're supposed to, they're supposed to leave the sled with you. Well, not well, the sled, but the, the, the guide was supposed to, to uh, lead us over the mountain and, mm. and, and to, to safety. Yeah. And he didn't. We wandered in the woods for 11 hours. And who paid off the, the Russian guards there? Uh, the guy did. The guy did. He oh, that he did do? Yeah. All right. And uh, then you made your way into Hungary. You were not afraid that the uh, Germans were there uh, in Hungary? Well, n no. We, we, we weren't that aware of the situation in Hungary. Did you have a radio? How did you follow events? How do we follow? You, you mean during our escape? No, we, yeah. we, we, we didn't have a radio, we didn't have a compass, we didn't have anything. You just had your wits. Just our wits, yeah. And a, a very uh, smart mama. <laughs> <laughs> very smart, very courageous, yeah. and a little bit crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for coming. Um, Julian Padowitz, you've heard it, mother and me, and uh, thank you so much for sharing it with us. My great pleasure. Shalom. Shalom. If we just started with a whisper just to know